And I looked him in the eyes and I said, I know you know what I'm talking about. Nobody has to tell you what the right thing is. Mm -hmm. You know what it is. I want you to do it the first time on time. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 95 of the Command of Voice. Today, I continue my conversation with Richard Skillman. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Camino Voice Podcast, where I interview folks around Camino Island and beyond. If you want to stay up to date on events, businesses, and even hear a little history of this area, subscribe to this podcast and share with your friends. Thanks for listening. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. On this episode, we continue my conversation with Richard Skillman. Now, last time, we talked about the Vietnam War and his experience with that. And if you haven't listened to that already, be sure to jump back and listen to that episode. This episode, we're going to get into the business side of it. So we're going to talk about what his experience was as a CEO of a company with over 4,000 team members, um, how you make an impact uh, when you have that many team members, how do you keep motivation going, uh, and how he turned around some one of these companies um, that didn't have long to, to continue on uh, and how we turned it around in a very short amount of time. So we get into all that and more. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Richard Skillman. Uh, it's a very personal experience. Mm-hmm. And, and as, a, as, as you know, as a leader, as a CEO yourself, <laughs> uh, that, uh, and I learned this early on, uh, the CEO, uh, actually doesn't do the work uh, for, right. the, for the most part. Right. What you're hoping to achieve, you have to achieve through people. Right. So they're the ones that actually do the work. And my job, in a bigger sense, in a multi, multi-billion dollar organization, was uh, to provide resources mm-hmm. so that your team could be their best. Yeah. You know, you, you were asking me, or at least your questions refer to uh, being a CEO in hospitals and what was that like and et cetera. Yeah. And the way I approached it uh, uh, is that, especially in healthcare, uh, every interaction with a patient and family is, is an opportunity for healing. Right. Every interaction. I don't care if you're giving them medicine or you're washing their sheets or you're doing whatever to their room. Every interaction is creating a healing environment. Mm -hmm. And so every member of my team, even when it was 4,000 employees, uh, they were were in the heat business of healing. You know, the engineers that took care of the uh, heat and the air conditioning and the oxygen and all of that, they were just as integral to creating uh, the experience for patients. Mm -hmm. And the end result was... And I used to go out and I'd talk to patients as they were leaving. And I'd say, well, how did we do? You know, and, and, and the whole measure in my mind was, were they, were they better off after they left? Mm-hmm. Did we do what we need? Did we do everything we could do to give them the healing experience they needed? Yeah. So I, I, what I'm talking, what, what we were talking about with you, about what you do with your team uh, is just you just extrapolate that to a larger organization. Now it's very complex because you're dealing with doctors, and and you know doctors have egos, and <laughs> they, and they, you know and and it's uh, in some ways it's justifiable. I mean they're they're doing some pretty amazing things. Right. Uh, so one of the things that I recognized uh, when I had to learn how to deal with doctors. Um, as a young administrator, was that uh, I needed to let them know that I respected them yeah. for the work that they did. Right. But I wasn't going to pull up, put up with any of their BS. <laughs> you know I, that uh, that okay, they can they can do whatever they're going to do. Uh, but you know, I'm we have as a hospital, we have an objective with patients, and our and and we're going to do that. Right. Are, are you on board or not? Right. And 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 but you would do it in a way that that was very respectful. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, um, and how, how I managed it, uh, my day was I would start out uh, in the emergency room. I would walk through the emergency room because that would give you a sense of what's happened in the last 24 hours, you know, what big things are of anything that's been going on, um, what emergency surgeries have happened. So I'd go through the, I'd go through the emergency room, then I'd go uh, into the surgeon's lounge because that was where the day was shaping up. Mm -hmm. And that's where you'd get to see the doctors that were doing the surgery and your team and your nurses and the OR staff. You'd see them at the beginning of their day, and you'd get to get a feel for what's going on. And yeah. how can I help them in that moment? You know, how can I help them? And, and I would do all of that before, and then I'd walk through a lot of the departments before going to my office because... One of the things that I didn't like doing was sitting behind my desk. <laughs> I, you know, that's I didn't like that. So I generally had a pretty small desk. Um, some of the hospitals, when I came in and succeeded somebody, and the prior administrator had this huge executive chair with you know big all of them. <laughs> oh my god, get rid of that thing. But uh, I I would much prefer to meet people in their workspaces. Mm-hmm. And talk to them and find out how they're doing, what do they need, and how are we doing. Um, so anyway, that's yeah. that's kind of a rambling commentary. But yeah. I think what, uh, finally, in terms of my work as a hospital CEO, um, my job was to convince people. Uh, I, I My philosophy was that, uh, that people want to be their best. They want to do their best. Mm-hmm. And most of them know how to do that, uh, but there are things in the way. Right. So my job as a CEO was, A, to convince them that they could be their best Mm -hmm. and that I was there to help them eliminate any obstacles to that occurring. And that was my job. So when I was able to do that, Throughout the organization, at, at all levels, doctors, nurses, environmental services, all of the, everybody mm-hmm. in the whole organization, if I was able to convince them that I knew they could be their best and I wanted them to be their best, yeah. and my job was to get rid of the uh, impediments to that. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing when an organization believes that. Yeah, you can. <laughs> it's yeah. amazing. It's transformative because what it happens, and it's all of a sudden the organization starts working in a whole different way. Right. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. No, that's. Um, <clears throat> I think for in that, like when you have that large of a team and that big, it it for me it gets. Um, I mean, overwhelming for one, but it's like. I can, because I, maybe because I spent a lot of time in small business, um, you know, growing up, my dad had small, small businesses, um, and then now owning one, like I understand how to manage a team of that size and like work with them. And like, you get, you know, all of them still, they know you when it gets to that large, it's, it's really hard for me to like, I guess, break that down of like, how do you, Im, you know, implore all of those beliefs into those people? How do you continue to encourage them? How do you, um, you know, continue to interact with so many different team members when, you know, maybe even some of them don't even know who you are as you're reaching out to them and talking with them. Well, the, the uh, thing about being a CEO in a hospital is, um, for the most part, uh, ho- hospitals are like little towns. Mm-hmm. And, and the, there's the formal organization, and then there's the informal organization, <laughs> <laughs> and one of the tricks of being a successful CEO is to find out the informal organizational structure, how things are communicated, who are the communicators, yeah. who are the ones that you know will, will either broadcast to their network, this guy's okay, or this guy's a schmuck, or whatever. <laughs> uh, and so it, it was important to find out who are the key communicators mm-hmm. and, and and pay attention to them but the the thing is uh, you have to model what you're saying to people you have to embody it yourself and how you carry yourself how you interact with people 
you, I, could, I could have an interaction with somebody uh, in, in, in the cafeteria. And within a couple hours, it was throughout the whole organization. <laughs> and so it, 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 I understand what you're saying, uh, and it is complex, and you don't get to know everybody with 3,000 doctors and 4,000 or 5,000 employees. Right. But you can, uh, you can establish an impression and a behavior, and if you're consistent with it, then people will understand they'll understand the direction you want the organization to go um they will understand their role and how to achieve that Mm -hmm. in your example with your company you know everybody has a job and and a way to contribute to your success right everybody and they know that yeah well that's what you do with a big hospital i mean it takes <laughs> i mean it takes a lot of effort and and it actually takes a lot of time my yeah. uh, i worked from about i was on the job between seven o'clock in the morning and and oftentimes nine o'clock at night and that times you had because it's twenty four seven you had to come you had to come in in the middle of the night for the night shift you had to come in for weekends and they had to see you they had to see you there. Even if you didn't interact with them, everybody they had to see you that you're there. You're you're there, right? And and so um, that that's how I did it. And 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 fortunately, uh, I was pretty well successful. Yeah, I mean, it it was as they say, it was uh, God's grace and uh, you know the luck of the draw. But uh, I was able to. Hey, it's Brandon jumping in really quick. Uh, you'll notice that the phone rang during this part of the conversation, and then I, I cut it out because I didn't want you know any private information getting out. Um, but he did say something at the end of that that I didn't catch the full recording of, so I did want to mention it here. Is he said since his marriage, uh, second marriage, um, and running businesses and stuff like that, he always wanted his wife to know that she was his number one priority. So he always answers the phone when she calls. So I thought that was really cool. So, anyways. Uh, now we'll get back to the podcast. Yeah, that's great. Um, so then, so now we've kind of seen like um, what it looked like as your role um, as a CEO. But what was it like for you when you stepped into these? Because again, you were talking about these massive organizations that you're stepping into. What was, you know, I guess maybe picking out one that like the culture wasn't where you wanted it to be. How did you start moving it in that direction? Well, uh, one of the latest assignments I had, last assignments I had, was a hospital in California in Hemet, and it was faced with um, the possibility of not only failing its Joint Commission survey, which is a, a, a triannual survey of hospitals to see if you're doing what you're supposed to do. Okay. But they were faced with losing their license. Wow. Things were so bad. Okay. It was terribly dysfunctional. And I had four months to correct the situation. Uh, and I went down there and, and I realized that uh, the usual ways you would work with that because you had uh, six months, a year, or two years to do, mm-hmm. that wasn't going to work. Right. So I, I, I decided that I was going to convince everybody of a mantra. I created a mantra. <laughs> okay. And the mantra was, do the right thing the first time on time. Okay. It sounds simple, and in some ways it is. But to get people to believe it and to do it and convince them that that's what I expected them to do. Right. And I started from the senior management team all the way down, and including the doctors. And um, as I said, you had to live it. So I was there. Uh, it was pretty exhausting because I had to be there 24-7. I, I mean, I did sleep now and then, but uh, you had to be at every level in the organization every day right. of the week and just be like a broken record. I want you to do the right thing the first time on time, and I know you can do it. And I looked them in the eyes, and I said, I know you know what I'm talking about. Nobody has to tell you what the right thing is. Mm-hmm. You know what it is. Right. I want you to do it the first time on time. And, it, and believe it or not, 
they bought it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, they bought it. I mean, we were having, there was internecine warfare between doctor groups, and, and uh, this was a, it was a very dysfunctional organization. I, I mean, in any event, uh, within, within two months or so after standing in front of everybody and saying, <laughs> This is what I want you to do. This is what it's going to take for us to survive right. and, and thrive. If this is what we're, we're serving a community of 80,000 people. This is what it's going to take to still be here as their health care provider. And I, I just had to be a broken record every day. And I would say, okay, what's in the way of you doing that? Yeah. Tell me. I will see if I can get it out of the way. Mm-hmm. And I would do that. I mean, you know, one of the things that was, it was extraordinary to me in the emergency room, they didn't have a portable uh, EKG machine. If the patient came in and was in, it was in a coronary challenging situation, and they had to move from the emergency room to the ICU, they didn't have a portable uh, EKG monitoring device. They didn't. The ones they had were broken. I said... I said to the person, that's ridiculous. I said, you get on the phone today and you, you go get one. I don't care what it costs. You know, at yeah. that point, it doesn't matter because you can't be a hospital and not have that. Yeah. So, I mean, I had to do that multiple times, multiple times throughout the organization mm-hmm. with multiple people. And by gosh, in four months, they not only um, uh, passed their joint commission survey, uh, but they passed their state licensure. They kept their license. And I, I overheard conversations that people were stunned that paperwork arrived when it was supposed to. The blood work was done. The test results were posted. They, they just had no idea that this is how things could be. Yeah. And there, there was no miracle because they already knew how to do it. Yeah. They just had to be convinced to do it. Yeah. And and to have somebody have faith in them, yeah. that was a that was a key thing. They had to know that I had faith that they could do this. Yeah, all they had to do was choose to do it, and it could be, we could do it, and it happened. It was it was a miracle. But anyway, uh, that that was pretty satisfying. Yeah, it was. Uh, awesome. You know, I, I left that community with a operating hospital that worked, <laughs> <laughs> and and they all they all knew how it could work. You know, yeah. and so. Um, so one, what you were saying there, one of the things that <clears throat> I think um, as leaders um, is a lot of times we think, or at least what I get stuck in and where, where I cause um, is that communication level is sometimes we will say something, we'll go to a team member and say, okay, this is what we want you to do. This is it. Got it. Here's the written form of it. You can reference it when you need it. And then we walk away. And then a week later, they don't do it. And you're like, why? I, like, I just told you, like, to do this. The, the repeating, the continually doing that is, um, is that, that's where it gets, it, it feels, I don't know what, what the feeling necessarily is, but it, like, it almost feels like strange because it feels like you're talking down to someone almost when you have to repeat it multiple times. How do you kind of push past that where it's, you don't feel like you're just, saying the same thing, but you're actually convincing them of what you're saying. Well, in those circumstances, my first thought is that something else is going on. They're not dumb. Mm-hmm. You know, they hear what you're saying. They can read what you're saying, what you want. So something else is happening. Mm. And as a leader, if you want that person to stay, and if they want to stay, uh, I, I would... I don't know how to work it in a small community like this. I don't know what your employee marketplace is, you know, how, yeah. you know. Uh, and there's a term that's called fungible, which means that A is the same as B is the same as C. And I don't believe that employees. They're not fungible. So anyway, um, and I never treated them as that. Um, something is happening. There, there, There's a disconnect there and and... You have to find out what it is. There were times where I would discover that, um, you know, one of the lead housekeepers or one of the housekeepers, they were struggling with doing work. And I would, I would actually go there and I'd say, okay, what's happening? And you'd find out that suddenly their, their home life 
is really in disarray. Mm-hmm. And and you'd have to you know uh, as a leader you'd have to decide are are you going to apply the resource to try to change that or are you just going to say to the person okay you either do this or you leave. Um, in many cases, in most cases, I tried to find a resource to help them. Mm-hmm. And, and I would, in, in the case of the hospital, we have social workers, we have people that are trained, and I'd say to the social worker team, I said, Why would you please have somebody go talk to this because this is what's going on and it's really affecting their life. And, and you would only have to do that two or three times before the rest of the organization would know that. Yeah. And so in the case you're describing, you, you would have to, as a leader, you would have to find out what is the underlying circumstance that's mm-hmm. causing that. Yeah. And, and once you discover that, then you sit with the person and you say, okay, now I see this is what's going on. And is this something you feel you can change on your own? Do you need my help to help change it? Because in order for you to stay in this organization, this group, you have you need to change you need to do these things because we we rely on you that when this happens and a customer comes in and this is what they require this is what we hope and want you to do because this is our our goal yeah and we want you to be part of this now right now you're not i mean you you have to look them in the face and say you're not part of this right now Mm -hmm. and i want to help you become part of it because i'd like you to stay here and be part of our team yeah but you have to tell me what's going on, what is going on, because clearly there's a disconnect, and I'm not going to be a broken record. You know, I I wouldn't, yeah. Be, being a CEO of a large organization, there are certain things you have to communicate, and one of them is that we will have a conversation once, mm-hmm. and if we have to have a second conversation, then there's a trouble and, and there's no room for a third. So, uh, you know, we, we can't afford it. We can't afford to have a third conversation about the same thing. Right. Yeah. So anyway, that's what I would do. Is I would try to figure out, with the, with the help of the person that you're concerned about, what's really going on here. Yeah. Do you yeah. not want to be here? Right. You know, maybe they don't. Maybe they'd rather be doing X. Yeah. But, uh, and then you say, well, the reality is you're here. And if you want to stay here, here's what the expectations are. Right. Yeah. That's that's great. Um, I think, um, <laughs> you know, I think that is something that we, uh, you know, in small business stuff like that, you run into a lot. You know, my, you know, at times like managers, when we've brought on team members and they feel like they're like, I say the same thing over and over. Like, why is this not? This isn't getting better. It's doing the same thing. And. Um, you know, part of that is I'm like, you know, we, we bring on a lot of kids, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they're kids. This mm-hmm. is their first job out of, out of home. And so mm-hmm. I'm like, you got to kind of look at it from that perspective as well of like, I have kids. And so I, I know, you know, that you've got to tell them hundreds of times before they like, Oh, I'm supposed to do that. And then they still might not do it cause they're going to decide to go play with their friends. But, um, You know, as we're training these kids, we want to train them with life skills that they can then take to their next job. Exactly. Because that's exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You are you are training for life skills. Yeah. And uh, you're you're hoping to give them some teachings and learnings that they will, as you said, take not only to their next job, but their whole life. I mean, because they're making decisions and decisions have consequences. Mm -hmm. And and. The sooner they learn that, that that's true, because I remember being a teenager. I mean, you know, you're immortal. You're, <laughs> you're immortal. It doesn't really matter. And, well, it does. And uh, so that you have a great opportunity yeah. to here to help provide them with a foundation for going forward in life. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so then you, you did get out of the hospital industry, um, and then you have... Uh, Eagle Digital Productions. Yes. Was that started during the time you were still? No. Okay. No. <laughs> so tell us about that. What is it? Um, how did you get started in it? Well, it's a, it, we. I retired, and I uh, I knew I was not not going to do any hospital work anymore. I was 
about killing me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, literally, because it takes a physical toll. Mm-hmm. I mean, you are emotionally and physically committed to this organization 24-7. There is no vacation. Yeah. And uh, after you do that for a while, you, know, you get worn out. So um, I was worn out. Anyway, I uh, was sitting with a friend whose wife was 12 years older than he was. And I was sitting at their dining room table, and she had a book of her poetry in front of her. And over her left shoulder was a watercolor she had done. And to her right shoulder was a piano because she was a musician, and she, she was in a choir, and she led. And I thought to myself, when she dies, her story's gone. Mm-hmm. Her story is gone. Why did she do these things, and what was in her mind, and how did it happen? And I made a decision at that point that I wanted to explore how to document that. Yeah, and how how to how to do it in a way, and and then give it to the person, because I thought this would be really important for them, but also for their children and their grandchildren, mm-hmm. to understand why this person <clears throat> was very creative and here did poetry and did watercolors and and where did that come from? So I ended up uh, sitting down with her with two little Canon cameras and a tripod and. And th- this was early on. I didn't know about lighting and I didn't know about sound. But anyway, I did it and we had a conversation. And I I figured I had to learn how to do post-production work because I had to create a video. Yeah. And at that point, we were producing DVDs. Uh, right now, we just post up the Vimeo. But uh, then we would give the person a DVD and then I'd gift it to them. I'd say, here, this is... Be, and I'd sit down like we're doing today and have a conversation with them. Uh, and give them an opportunity to feel safe, mm-hmm. comfortable, in talking about something that's very personal, which is their creative process. Yeah. How did they do these things? Where did the ideas come from? What did they then do? Uh, because there's a lot of art that I don't understand. Yeah. You could tell me it's art, and I'd say, okay, well, it's art. <laughs> you know, it's art. All right, so you tell me so. But I try. I wanted to try to understand the creative process, and after working with her, I, I then just, we were living on Vashon at the time, and Vashon is an extraordinary uh, art c- community. Yeah. Tons of creative people. And, and I decided I really like doing this. So I ultimately uh, was able to entice a, uh, another person to work for the same fee I got, which was zero, <laughs> uh, to, to handle the lighting. Uh, and then I uh, realized how important sound was. And I was able to find someone, again, willing to work for my salary uh, (laughs) and focus on the sound. And ultimately, I was able to get somebody to also do cameras. So we now have, uh, and my my wife, my sweetheart, Shereen Zalno, is my artistic director. She has a wonderful eye for composition and colors, and which I don't. So I do all the post-production work, and I do the interviewing, and... Our goal has been to find artists that we are curious about, Mm -hmm. curious about, uh, like a poet. How does a poet write a poem? Where does that come from? Yeah. You know, and uh, we've done a poet. We've done writers. We've done musicians. We've done playwrights. We've done painters and sculptors. Uh, We've done about 25 so far. Okay. And uh, that's under Eagle Digital Productions. It's a nonprofit. And we don't charge for this. Okay. You know, because we think it's so important to document the creative process, give a person who's creative. I mean, you're creative, for heaven's sakes. Look what you've done. Mm -hmm. And there's a process you went through to imagine what it could be and how to get to it. Right. Well, that's what we like to help people talk about. And and again, it's a very personal, private thing. And, And we say, nothing goes on the video that you don't want. Yeah. You have editorial control over the story because it's your story. It's not my story. It's your story. Yeah. And uh, but I have my art is the video. Mm -hmm. That's my art. Yeah. So here we have two creative people coming together to collaborate on something and then we give it to them. And and some of the artists have been kind enough to uh, give me some of their art. So we, we have paintings in our home. Uh, from some of the people I've worked for. We've yeah. got an, an incredible uh, Ansel Adams kind of uh, black and white, big landscape 
photo that uh, John Anderson that we worked with uh, gave me. Anyway, it's it, cool. it's just been a wonderful journey, you know. And uh, uh, as I say, having moved to Camano Island uh, from Vashon, we moved uh, two weeks before the pandemic shut everything down. Okay. So <laughs> here we are in a new neighborhood. We don't know anybody. <laughs> we can't go anywhere. And uh, we can't meet our neighbors like we usually do. Mm-hmm. So how do, you, how do you get a sense of community? And, and we really don't have that yet. And one of the things that uh, I uh, see that you uh, were going to ask me about was what purchase $100 or less that you've enjoyed. And, and my answer is, come here to Camino Commons. Yeah. Because this, this has been, for me, uh, a, a small sense of community. Yeah. Coming here and interacting with Jerry and Stasha and some of the other folks uh, and Jen and getting to know you know the people that work here, Rochelle. Yeah. Uh, it's just been uh, my li- lifeline to create a community, and, and I'm looking forward to the time that we can, as a as a community, start coming together again. Yeah, in larger groups because. We are an island. Now we lived on Vashon Island. It was, a, a, you can only get there by ferry. Right. So that, uh, and we knew that in a, in a major emergency, uh, we were on our own. Right. So that creates a real sense of community. Yeah. And we had that for 25 years. Mm-hmm. And we left that because uh, I, I was 25 years older and I couldn't maintain our house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. It was it was multi level and a steep slope and our water system was 135 feet down a gorge and I mean it was oh. just you know <laughs> well so what was fun 25 years ago is not fun anymore <laughs> so we're we're now on Camino and Thunder Ridge and we love we live on a single level it's a very nice home um, we didn't have to throw out any of our art <laughs> we found a place for it so it's nice. all there so we're we are here on Camino and. Um, I'm hoping to discover uh, more about the community. Uh, we've, I've not been in, uh, in contact with the artist community here. Mm-hmm. I know that there's a lot of art that's yeah. being created here. Yeah. Um, I am looking forward to finding a way to talk to and get to know some of the artists here yeah. because that's been my life's bread for the last 25 years. Yeah. And I uh, look forward to that. So Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, I do have rapid-fire questions that um, I like to end the podcast with. You've answered the first one. Um, for the second one, uh, pretend you have a friend coming from out of town. What would the first day look like here? Well, I, there's, there are several things here that I'd want them to be uh, introduced to. I think the parks are one thing. Uh, the trails, uh, it's a wonderful island in that sense it's very mm-hmm. rich in, in natural resources and the second thing is i'd bring him here uh because this this is when you look at what's here this is like a hub yeah and there's a lot of different things that are going on here and i know if it weren't the pandemic there'd be a lot more things going on here yeah. so uh, this is this is a place i would bring them yeah very cool all right who is an interesting or fascinating person in this community that i should interview next well, you've already interviewed uh, Zach Haley. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I think that, uh, I mean, Zach Abbey, uh, Zach and Haley uh, yep. uh, are, are, to me, a very interesting people. Um, I'm at a disadvantage because uh, I, we've been here for a year now under the pandemic. You're right. <laughs> so I haven't really met anybody to other than the ones that I'm familiar with to pass on to you. Yeah. No, nope, that's fine. Um, lastly, if you could have a message on a billboard right on Camino Island, what would that say? Uh, you know, I think that, uh, let me look, because I thought about this last night, and I think that um, the important thing to me to communicate to people is that we need each other. Mm-hmm. We are a community. Yeah. And yes, there's a bridge over to Stanwood, but there may be times where that's not available. Mm-hmm. And we, have, we may have natural resource or natural disasters or something. And we really need each other. Right. And I think it's important now to, especially after the pandemic, to kind of remind people that 
uh, yeah, over this last year, we've had to be isolated and apart and masked up and everything. But in reality, uh, for us to get through the next period of time, whatever, we need to feel that sense of community. Yeah. So I would say we need each other, and then we are a community. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Oh, you're welcome, Brandon. All right. And Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Richard Skillman for joining me on the podcast today, and thank you for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps us be found by other Islanders like yourself. And for more information on this episode, you can go to CaminoCommons.com slash EP95. That's CaminoCommons.com slash EP95. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.